Hello, welcome back to day two of Config 2023 and the final sessions we have for you all. Hard to believe it's almost over, right? Well, let's make the most of it and make these sessions the best ones yet. Now, helping close this off is Natalia, who is a research scientist at MIT Lab. Now, probably not that many people can claim that the devices they've designed have been used in space, but Natalia sure can, and I'm super excited to hear her speak. So let's give Natalia a warm welcome to the stage. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here, and thanks for making it to the final, final session of today. Indeed, we're going to talk about space and much more. And while you're still wondering, why are we talking about this after a whole day of talking about AI? Well, guess what's going to happen? We're going to talk about the key enabling technology, without which neither AI, true AI, nor AGI will not be possible. Brain-computer interfaces. The brain, your brain, the brain of your user. Mind-controlled MIT, how to design the next generation of brain-computer interfaces. Why should you care? Well, because we are having a lot of devices around us, on us. Think about those sleep trackers you're wearing, those fancy rings, or the bracelets that track your fitness levels and your heart rate and uh, all of the other activities. They're getting closer and closer to your bodies. And they're getting more and more insights about your body. And now, with the ability of us having head-worn devices, I'm wearing just one right now. I can see a lot of you wearing some types of caps, eyeglasses, headphones. We can have an insight about what your user thinks, what your user wants. But let's get back maybe 25 years ago when little Natalia saw one of her most favorite movies, Johnny Mnemonic, 1995. Oh yeah, that's an old classic. Look at this Keanu Reeves. 320 gigabytes of antivirus in his brain against a pandemic that is called nerve attenuation syndrome. Guess against what that is. It's because people are spending too much time in virtual reality. Uh, doesn't it remind you of something? Just saying. And of course, there is this amazing cybernetically enhanced dolphin just in there with a brain implant. Ask my husband, I still want to do this one day. I really want to have this dolphin. And of course, all of those screens, they mesmerized Natalia, and that's how I even got into computer science. But fast forward 15 years later, another interesting movie got out. Let's take a look. You always have to wake up. They can fix a spinal if you got the money. But not on vet benefits. Not in this economy. A VA check and 12 bucks will get you a cup of coffee. I'm what they call waitlisted. Some could argue this reminds you of today's San Francisco. I would totally agree this reminds me for that 12 bucks coffee, that's for sure. However, yeah, James Cameron hit it real close to home, and I'm ready to argue that this is the reality we are building right now. And before we discuss how not to settle into this reality and what technology can help us, let me just real quick introduce myself. I have been doing brain-computer interfaces for my whole professional life and career, starting 
from actually high school. And a lot of companies, organizations, and nonprofits have supported my work throughout the years. So this is just a shout out to them. But let's get back to the cool stuff, to the brain. We're going to be talking about non-invasive brain-computer interfaces today. And I'm going to be using the term BCI throughout this talk. That's what it means. But that's what usually happens when I tell everyone what I'm doing. That's the face, and that's the, the question. What I'm actually doing is brain reading. I'm trying to understand what happens in your brain, what are those electrical activities that flow, synapses, but also do a bit of mind reading. I try to understand what happens to your brain when you look at something, when you desire something, when you're afraid of something. And though brain reading is not the same as mind reading, I'm going to give you the examples of the talks of this two throughout this talk. Let's start actually right now. I can see around like 20% of heads here down because you're looking into your digital screen in your phone, in your tablet. I understand you're about to check in on your flight, get your arrangements for your dinner. I understand that. But guess what? Your brain really still doesn't like digital. I know it has been like, what, 60 years we are living in digital world? Still doesn't like it. Seven types of memory are activated when you are using paper notes or paper book. That's why in all of those hotels we are all staying, we have a lot of fancy printouts. A lot of menus are still on the print. Only three types of memory activated when you're using a digital tablet. And, of course, our magic unicorn chat GPT, spoiler alert, your brain likes it even less. Yeah, check, uh, visit us in Boston. Um, we're going to tell you more. You can even be part of our study. <laughs> oh. However, now with each single major company out there releasing their own hardware, I don't need to run after my user convincing them to put something on the head. That's already done. We have now these devices, and you can wear them. So not a single person here actually wears an XR headset, but that's for a bit later in this talk. However, even with all of those devices available and purchasable, of course, what we have an issue as brain scientists is to now deal with the aftermath of what all of those devices have done to your brain. And they have done a lot of damage, like a lot. All of the devices around you that you're using creating and form your habits, good and bad. Let's give just a simple example to start with from the physical world. When you're going shopping, would play this song for maybe a bit more. There would be 91% probability that you would end up this evening buying a bottle of French wine getting a glass of French wine, a French dessert, or going to a French restaurant altogether. I just primed you unconsciously with the music to get something French. That's a very easy one. It's usually called neuromarketing. No one likes it. You are the permanent victim of it. <laughs> However, of course, unfortunately, jokes aside, of course, there are much more nefarious examples. The feet that totally eats down all of your dopamine and makes you fully addicted. Or, hopefully, none of you here are being part of designing these deceptive patterns. But I'm pretty sure you as all users have seen or have been victim of at least one. All in all, your brain is a slave of your devices. You are not in control of your devices. They are in control of you. So how can we get this control back? What should we do? Should we like break these bad habits, design only for good habits? What should we do? What we can do and how can we actually design the systems for the betterment of humanity? I would argue that we need to look into spaces. I know, spaces, Bay Area, whole June 2023 was about spaces, especially the beginning of the month. Uh, spaces in the context of spatial computing, the terms that my lab coined around 30 years ago. 
But I would argue that we need to look at the spaces in the context of the brain and brain interaction. Because you exist outside of your screens. And more importantly, you use a bit more than just your eyes or voice or your hands to interact with your devices. Though most of design kind of tries to convince you otherwise. Let's give some examples. We are here in the Moscona Center. And guess what? No one liked yesterday to go to their hotel room and to watch those talks in the room. You wanted to be here. You wanted to be present, connected with your peers. Some of us are connected over Zoom, watching those talks. Hey, virtual audience. And also they were in their brain sensing devices to support their attention levels. Some of us are driving and wearing their brain sensing devices to support their state and not to fall asleep. Some of us are enjoying a walk with our parents in a park and making sure that the brain sensing device will give us insights if there are any early signs of cognitive decline. Some of us are facing a lot of health challenges and use those devices to have supported communication at the hospital. Some of us are just beginning this journey on Earth and enjoying their playtime and growth mindset while wearing the brain sensing devices. And some of us are already in between the worlds, digital and real. Here in this example, a user is imagining a soccer ball and that soccer ball appears on the screen in front of them. They are thinking in their head about a red square, and it appears on the screen in front of them. This is done using brain activity only. We call this what you think is what you get. And some of us, uh, as the host mentioned, are actually not even on this Earth altogether. They are in space. They are working to move us away and move our civilization away to other planets. And they have earned their brain sensing devices to make this happen. All in all, brain interaction is everywhere. But how can we make it commonplace? Well, for this, we need to go a bit deeper. And I would say specifically maybe 10 years ago, I call this Natalia and her octopus era. This is a common state of brain sensing that you would see in scientific publications. Tons of electrodes and the first design lesson here just for you, just for free. Don't wear makeup and nice dresses to the BCI lab ever. That's gonna end real bad, like real bad panda eyes, not working. Or oh, another one, Natalia in her fMRI era, in addition to ridiculous headset I have, which is also an EG headset, I have that $1.5 million machine behind me, which I'm gonna lay down and enjoy. Sars Carson here, my time in, in cold. And guess what? Yeah, your user is not going to wear those or have those. So you don't have easy access to any of those. So what we needed to do is go through the evolution that the personal computers have undergone from the mainframes to the computer that is the size of the palm of our hand. And we have done that. We have built a suite of variable wireless devices that look very similar and actually same as your everyday headwear. The cost on one device like this is equal to one session in fMRI. And unlike fMRI, you can still enjoy your coffee and your morning newspaper while wearing it. And it would make possible for this to come true. Let's watch another video. The new op center is over here. That just came online. These swarm assemblers, they can put up a building in six days. We have done more here in a year than in the previous 30 years. When I... Here we see at least three different BCI enhancements. We see the avatar one, we see the exoskeletons, and we also see the swarm of those robots that are ready to do different tasks for us. This was in 2023, and we actually got our hands also in 2023 on one of the very similar robots. And 
uh, watch what we have built with it. Do you want me to go to the kitchen? Yes. Do you want me to meet you at the living room? Yes. All in all, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All in all, each single device we build is making our life healthier and longer. That's what all of those devices are for. However, I'm ready to argue that with each single device, our brain is having harder and harder time to understand them, to work with them. They are getting more and more cognitively demanding, mentally demanding. With now the arrival of the BCI on the market, we are hopeful to not alleviate the challenges of all of those previous devices, but also with enablement of AI, we can hopefully build a true empathetic AGI. AGI will not be possible without BCI. If you want to build a system that truly understands us as humans, if you want to truly aim for a fusion between the human brain and the computer brain to evolve in possibly another species. Think about it. If we take just large language models, we have been talking earlier today, is there a system, LLM-based, that would be able to understand a person that is fully paralyzed, the person that cannot talk, cannot move, cannot do anything with their body. And guess what? There are a lot of people who are either born with no voice or are losing the voice or ability to talk towards the end of their lives because of the accidents. A limb will be there for nothing. You need a system that is truly understanding the human brain. And BCI is a key enabling technology for this to happen. But same as LMs are booming right now because of the hardware and language data, we are aiming for the same with BCIs. More specifically, we are just getting into hardware evolution to ensure that the devices we are creating and varying can effectively pick up brain activity while staying variable. Your face masks, your eyewear, your airports, all of those you are already wearing on your head. And this can be easily enhanced with brain sensing. Here are some of the iterations of the device we have been building for the past seven years at MIT. We call it Attentive View. This is a pair of glasses. On the bridge of the nose, there are sensors that can pick up your eye movements with no use of cameras. It's based on the electrical activity from your eyes moving. On the side of the ears, we are picking up brain activity. And the device is fully manufactured in the United States. We have material, electrical, mechanical, graphical design, all of those together to build this device. However, I have some news. Seven years later and X million dollars later, it's not enough to build hardware. 
you also need to think about the ecosystem for it. 97% of all of the software support for BCI systems are desktop only. You're not going to go to space with a desktop, believe me. No, not going to happen. You need to think about mobile solutions, edge solutions, embedded solutions that we are building. And again, some of the news, software alone is not enough to understand humans. After building AI and ML systems for the past 15 years, I can tell you that we need a lot of data. And unlike LLMs, compared to LLMs, we, in our BCI world, we do not have data. Like, literally, if we are to compare the amounts of data we are right now having with these devices. However, even though we cannot read your thoughts yet, in part because we don't have enough data yet, we can already augment the spaces that you interact with. We have been talking throughout this, this talk and also for the past two days about building habits. What BCI does is not some add-on that you will use in your design systems. It's something that's going to over-edge any of your designs. It's going to be that step zero that you would include to actually help your user and support them. Because we focus on what the user wants, what the user needs before the user knows it. Think about poker. We can tell if you are cheating, if you're going to bluff, if you're going to be cooperative between two to seven minutes before you're going to ever make a move. And this is just one of the examples. So how do we do this? We do a lot of measurements. Some of you are using eye tracking, but we measure everything. Eye movements, the example I just gave you, brain activity, and can you all stand up, please, for a second? Yay! Awesome, thank you. Some of the blood flow to your brain, but also thank you, you can take a seat. <laughs> it actually spiked your attention like for five, seven minutes, and by five to 17%, just the blood flow. So yeah, I'm working, working my talk. But what is more important is that 75 muscles in your body got activated for you to lift. If only one would fail, you would just fall to the ground. But your brain took minimal time to actually hear what I'm asking and then executing or non-executing what I was asking for. It's called muscle activity. We also measure it. And more importantly, we measure it when you sleep. One third of our lives we spend Sleeping. Think about a user experience as the lens of one third of one's life. That's a dream. What we are doing is we can interface subconsciously with the NREM1 stage of sleep. For those of you who have those fancy sleep trackers, you might know NREM1 is rapid eye movements, is that early stage of sleep. We have designed a system at the lab that is similar to a system from the 16th, 17th century used by Dali, Einstein, Tesla. When they were falling asleep, they were having a metal ball in their head. And then, when they fall asleep, the ball will fall, they will wake up, and they will take a pad and write down all of those ideas. We have done the same system, except of the metal ball in the hand. We are using the app that will talk to you in NREM1 stage of sleep, will guide your dreams. You will dream about what we are suggesting you to dream. You will have your dreams enhanced, and then you will wake up with more creative ideas. And of course, a lot of examples of something like covert visual special attention. I do not need to move my head or my eyes. I don't even need to blink. I can just stare straight on that exit sign and tell exactly what is happening in the first row on my left and on the first row on my right, without, again, use of any cameras. And of course, we use as an input for BCIs your focus, attention, desire, imagination, emotion. The mere fact of me putting an image of a coffee will again spike your attention by several percent, even if you are not a coffee drinker. <laughs> In the lab, we have explored multiple scenarios. Robot control, 
brain-to-brain -brain communication, erasing short-term memories while you sleep for PTSD treatment, to name just a few. Here is just a set of different sneak peeks. The DDoc project you have just seen is the first of its kind wireless, fully mobile system which is ice-free to interact with the patients who need more of their assistive care. The dog, the robot, can bring groceries, different shopping bags, open their door, etc. Space, another example, and another technology that will be out there fully available before AGI will become a reality. DCI is a key enabler for this technology where we would want to understand the state of the person in cooperative space in a limited environment where there is no gravity. We do this work in collaboration with NASA and Massachusetts General. One of our projects just flew on Axiom 2 missions this past May in Florida to ISS. And of course, in addition to science, we also fully embrace magic. Harry Potter. We build the system, we call it the thinking cap. Instead of putting you to one of the houses, it tells you what you're thinking about. And we use it for enhancing the growth mindset in schools, and we also use it for improving academic performance. And just in case you do not like Harry Potter, haven't met a person just yet, but just in case, it can be any universe. And finally, last but not least, for people who have the most challenging of their times, incurable diseases like advanced stages of ALS, where there is no more voice, there is no more eye movement, there is no more movement whatever, but brain activity is available and functioning. We use this system to allow those patients to communicate with their loved ones and with the hospital staff. We literally ship that pair of glasses and an app, we will give a phone if you need one, but that's it, that's what, it goes to the user. And we design, thank you, we design the system together with the caretakers from the get-go. We call this inclusive design. But this project and none of the other previous projects would not be possible without amazing team, so thank you, the team. <laughs> and my takeaway message for you, Humans need to become objects and not subjects of interaction. It's in your power to truly leverage your user's brain, as well as your own. And this is the key, not only for us striving a civilization, for our society, but also for our survival. Connect with me on Twitter, and if you liked all the fictional references I have put in this presentation, check out our latest project and then find me and tell me what was your favorite fictional universe. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Natalia. It was incredible to see just how much all of this next generation technology is rapidly approaching day-to-day -day wearability and usability.